Emotions are high due to the release and sudden unprecedented popularity of ChatGPT, which is a new language generating software recently purchased by Microsoft. When you create your free or paid ChatGPT account and you ask it questions for the very first time, it's a pretty staggering moment. At least it was for me. There are some limitations for sure, but especially in those first few minutes, ChatGPT appears capable of answering just about anything you could think to ask. You know, give me tips to better organize my school assignments, compose a social media post about psychology-related fun, uh, prepare a quiz about neuroscience, write me an essay about insert your latest homework assignment. As you can imagine, the potential for students to cheat on their classes using chat GPT has unnerved some faculty, and maybe rightly so. But if used in the right way, could this software actually support learning both in the classroom and beyond? Hello there, this is Bradley, and you're listening to Psych Everywhere, a podcast by Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology. For this show, distinguished guests weigh in on applying psychological science to a diverse range of current events and to better your life. Would you prefer to read along as you listen? A written transcript is available. See the link in the show notes for this episode. So last week on the show, we had our first ever non-human guest. In that episode, we asked ChatGPT itself, and it was voiced by a Psychi staff member, to answer just all sorts of questions relevant to students and faculty about its many uses and knowledge. If you haven't used ChatGPT yet, I encourage you to check it out because it'll give you some good ideas for things that it can or can't do. For today's episode, I'd like to expand our conversation about ChatGPT, this time with an expert in online communication. Should I mention that our guest today is a human? (laughs) It seems a little silly to say that now, but as tech like ChatGPT continues to develop, I don't know, maybe that'll be standard information one day for podcasts. Anyhow, I digress. Today's guest speaker is Dr. Morton Ann Jernsbacher, Villas Research Professor and the Sir Frederick C. Bartlett Professor of Psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. An expert in cognitive neuroscience and human communication and attention, Dr. Jernsbacher actually spoke with me about 10 years ago on the topic of autism and language comprehension for Psychize Magazine. So I remember her but I can't imagine that she remembers me. (laughs) Dr. Drinsberger has been very busy, and she has more achievements than I could even name. Um, So just as an example, she's been president of the Association for Psychological Science, the Society for Text and Discourse, the APA Division of Experimental Psychology, and as if three presidencies aren't enough, she's been president of the Foundation for the Advancement for Behavioral Brain Sciences. She's been editor-in-chief of the journal Memory and Cognition, and she's authored more than 150 journal articles and edited or co-edited numerous books. One of her specialties includes research in electronically mediated communication, and so it's no wonder that she really hit the ground running when ChatGPT came out by creating a special classroom assignment that faculty can use to teach their students about ChatGPT and how to use it ethically and professionally. It was that assignment that caught my interest and led me to reach out to her for today's episode. Dr. Jernsbogger, welcome to Psych Everywhere. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I am really excited to do this conversation. This program has just amazed me. And Last night, I found myself asking it to write um, alternate endings for Lost, (laughs) at which point I realized there's really not much it can't do. (laughs) Um, Absolutely. So my first question for you, 
um, I mean, gosh, could you share a couple examples of ways that you've used chat GPT? Yes, definitely. And I mean, your example of the alternate endings um, for Lost is a really good one. I was in a situation recently where I needed to write a lot of thank you notes, but I knew that other people would be seeing them. So I didn't feel um, that it would be appropriate for me just to carbon copy, you know, 20 different thank you notes the exact same way. So I asked chat GPT, you know, what are 20 different ways in two or three sentences to say thank you? And then I didn't take all of the suggestions, but it was really helpful for me to think about, yeah, you could say this, or you could say this, or you could say this. And so in that way, it was generating options for me that I probably would have thought of eventually, but it was nice to have them more rapidly. Uh, many of my colleagues are using it to debug their statistical software coding. And I can tell you as someone who does a lot of um, coding in you know, old-fashioned Visual Basic in Excel, that if I was to hit you know, an error that I couldn't understand, in the old days, what I would have done is just Googled it and tried to find the answer. So I was already, you know, um, outsourcing my my help. And being able to go to chat GPT to outsource is, is, in my opinion, a very similar way. And for some people, it's a much more direct way. Oh, I love that idea about thank you cards. I can't think how many times that, <laughs> you know, you get those office birthday cards <laughs> and, you're, and, you've, exactly. and you look at them and there's already 10 different little messages and you're like, I've got nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly. Then you, you get another one. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that, that would be awesome. So why do you think ChatGPT has become so popular so quickly? Well, I think you captured a lot of that excitement at the beginning of the podcast in the sense that it's doing things that, and, and I should say it chat GPT, meaning the whole family of large language learning models, LLMs, um, they are all doing things that for many of us, it's, it's kind of remarkable that we can, you know, as you said, ask it to provide 20 different endings for lost, or as I suggested, you know, what are 20 different ways to say thank you? Or um, one of my favorite examples is a person who tweeted about asking it to plan a birthday party, and there were certain constraints for budget, and then certain things that they enjoyed doing and certain things that they didn't enjoy doing. And again, you could probably amass all of that information yourself, if you have the time and the patience to Google lots of things or to talk to different people or to read other sources. But what's kind of remarkable about ChatGPT and other large language learning models is that it's doing it so quickly. And that's because it's been trained on just a huge, you know, vast majority of written language. Having said that, as we all know, the language that it was trained on is language that you know we humans provided. So we, we know that we know the source, but over time and over history. And so any of the biases that we humans have had over the last you know decades, um, any of the um, assumptions that we have held over the last few decades, that's also going to be represented in chat GPT because it's trained on the information that we provided to it. And we are the humans who wrote that. Our positions and our assumptions and our biases might have changed um, until currently, but it's collecting all of that information. And so it is going to be represented in the output that it provides. So there's the, a great 15 minute video that you made um, where you gave an overview of chat GPT. And I'm going to share a link to that in the show notes, as well as the classroom assignment. Um, so in that video, you listed a lot of news headlines about chat GPT. And some of them were really alarming, like, is the college essay dead? <laughs> and then others were more optimistic, like AI will augment, not replace. Um, so what do you think? Is all of the fear about chat GPT in the classroom misguided? Or could some, at least some of it be accurate? This is another great question. 
I'm a big believer in critical thinking, and I weave critical thinking through all of my courses. I would like to believe that I weave critical thinking through all of my life. I'm not, not sure I'm that successful, but I'm definitely, I definitely weave it through all of my courses, everything from basic stats, we talk about critical thinking, to research methods, we talk about critical thinking, to my upper division course, which is very relevant to chat GPT called Psychological Effects of the Internet. And I think when we apply critical thinking to something like chat GPT and to the fears, we realize that probably no invention in this world or any technology, no technology in this world has ever been all good. And most of them have not also been all bad. And as I mentioned in my course, Psychological Effects of the Internet, we begin the course talking about other moral moral panics over centuries, in fact. So for example, chess, the playing of chess, which we now think about as being incredibly brainy and most parents of teenagers would love if their, their offspring were spending three to four hours, you know, on a Saturday afternoon playing chess. There's an 1889 um, Scientific American article that decries the playing of chess. And why? Because it's a sedentary activity. It's because many young boys at the time, because again, we have our bias, can get very obsessed with it and want to play it all hours of the day. And because only the most elite and experienced and competent player can ever make a living off of playing chess. And when you think about it, those are some of the same concerns that current day parents have about children playing video games. It's sedentary, it can be addictive, and only the most elite player could ever make a living from it. There are other moral panics. For example, back in the 17th century, um, a moral panic about young girls reading novels. And this is when novels were first on the scene. I mean, it's hard for us to believe that we had literature for a long time before we had novels. But when novels um, were first on the scene, there were concerns, particularly about young girls reading novels, because these were fantasies. And, you know, there was this concern of young girls developing these fantasies and that they might incorporate those fantasies, particularly about romance and the like. And there's a, a very famous quote talking about how if there's been an increase in immorality in terms of elopement and even prostitution, it's most likely due to the increase in novels. And I can go on and on because in my class, we go over 20 of these either pastimes or technologies that previously had a lot of moral panic behind them. And I think it's important for us when we face a moral panic to evaluate how much is justified and authentic and real and how much is because it feels so different than what we were used to before. It seems like it's a kind of against the way of the world. Uh, one of my favorite moral panics was about, believe it or not, ballpoint pens. And if you've ever seen the movie Doubt, which was based on a book, um, and, and the movie is uh, with uh, Meryl Streep, and she's uh, concerned about the the lead priest in a school. And one of the things when someone's asking her, well, why are you so suspicious about him? And she even says, and he uses ballpoint pens. And so the whole notion was that it's too easy that, you know, instead of using pen well and a pen blade, that a ballpoint pen is taking the easy way. So that must make the person suspicious. Other examples, spell check, grammar check, which are really pretty close cousins of chat GPT. They're both based on prediction. They're both things that when they first were on the scene, many instructors were incredibly suspicious of them and felt like, you know, students will never learn how to spell or how to check their grammar if we allow them to use these apps. And I personally can tell you, and granted, I'm currently teaching, although I have a background in teaching high school, but I currently, the last, you know, 40 years have been teaching um, in higher ed, I welcome my students to use spell check and grammar check. I much prefer that um, I see 
the results of their work after they've been able to use apps like that to help them. What are some of the risks of students using ChatGPT and what are some of the benefits? To me, the big risk is for any of us, students or ourselves, to not apply critical thinking. I mean, it's just like with a spell checker. How many times have we seen that red wiggly line under Y-O-U-R because spell check thinks that we should be using Y-O-U apostrophe R-E, but we know we should be using Y-O-U-R. And so the same is true with chat GPT, that you still have to apply critical thinking. You can't just say, great, it's gone through spell check. So, you know, I know everything's perfect. Um, I think the other risk is what people talk about in the computer science field is GIGO, meaning garbage in, garbage out, G-I-G-O. And just like with a hand calculator, that if you don't know the precise calculations that you need to be inputting into the calculator, it's not going to fix that for you. And so I think the risks are, for any of us, over-relying on any app or device and, and forgetting that you know we're in the driver's seat and we're the ones that have to control the input and check the output. So let's talk about your ChatGPT assignment for students. So it's broken down into four goals. Um, And I've got a couple of questions about each of the goals. So the the first goal was to familiarize students with ChatGPT. So first, could you, uh, I don't know, just share very briefly how they go about that? Absolutely. Um, I give them a link. I give them a how-to sheet. Um, because I'm a big believer in how to <laughs> how to sheets, and so I give them a, a link to a how to sheet that in that how to sheet says go here, click here, do this, do that, in order for them to um, create a Chat GPT account. I also tell them if they do not want to create a Chat GPT account, that's fine. They can do an alternate assignment. I can just tell you roughly that out of 200 students who have done this assignment this past January, none of them wanted to opt out. Many of them had heard about it and wanted to to find out more about it. Um, I think it's important to familiarize students with chat GPT because I'm I'm really big about access and equity. And it would bother me to know that there are some students who have a familiarity with an app that could be helpful and other students who don't. And so this is my way of leveling the playing ground is to make sure that everyone is familiar with an app like ChatGPT, a spell check, a grammar check, or anything else that can help them with their work. Okay. Yeah, that was my next question is why do you think it's important to teach students this? I imagine some professors get excited by this thought and they want to rush to get the assignment so that they can use it in their classes. And that, but then that there's some other professors who are going, <laughs> why would you bring this to more people's attention? <laughs> exactly. And I completely appreciate that fear and that concern. And as I said, it's all about equity and access. So if we asked those professors, do you think all of your students are naive about it? Or do you think some already do have some knowledge of it? And if they were to say, I think they are all naive and I want to keep them all naive, that would be fine with me. But anytime I think about there being inequities, that maybe 15% of the students already know about it, but the other 85% don't, that's as someone Mm -hmm. who's who is very motivated by leveling playing fields, that that trumps the notion that we shouldn't be showing students things that um, we don't want them to know about. Already, the you know, as we say, the cat is out of the bag, the, whatever, the cow has left the barn, whatever those expressions are. And because of that, I think equity and access to me always trumps the phenomenon of only the privileged few have already gotten this access. Good answer. So the second goal is to help them see how it can be erratically accurate And I've experienced that a little myself yesterday when I was talking to it about Lost. I told it to write a scene for me and it said it can't do that because it isn't 
appropriate like it isn't in theme with the show and it said no and i said sure it is it happened in season five and it said my apologies and it just did <laughs> it just ran with it and i was like wow that was pretty easy <laughs> so i wondered um could you share about any of the inaccuracies that you've seen and kind of how to decrease these well um one of the parlor games that's been going around facebook and twitter is for um, people like myself to ask chat GPT to write a bio of ourselves. And those have been kind of funny because um, they're mm. virtually all been riddled with inaccuracies that we've been given awards that we never earned. We have been, you know, given editorships of journals that we never served as. We have, you know, there, there are lots of elaborations and falsifications in these bios because unless it has an accurate source of information, what it's going to do is predict. It's going to draw on a lot of other information and predict. So it might think, okay, I don't really know what this woman does, but I see that, you know, she's done some research in this area, maybe some research in this area, and then it's going to fill the gaps in that regard. And the same is true with the inaccuracies in the aspect of the assignment that I give to my students. And so I wanted to make it fun because I did this the first week of class. Not that my later weeks in class are not fun, but I wanted to make it fun. I wanted to make it something that would be approachable. And so I wrote six questions that were specific to my university and my university, the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So one of the questions is, who is Bucky Badger and what does he wear? And so for those of you who might not know, Bucky Badger is the University of Wisconsin-Madison mascot. And um, ChatGPT most typically answers that correctly. It has that knowledge, but typically bombs pretty dramatically on what Bucky Badger wears. And that might be because that's, again, not represented in its huge repertoire of previous information. Another um, example, another item that I have students ask ChatGPT to respond to is um, how long has, has Bucky Badger been the mascot at the University of Minnesota? Now, I just told you that he's the mascot at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, but I use that question um, to demonstrate that principle we just talked about, GIGO, the garbage in, garbage out, that ChatGPT might correct the question asker and say, Bucky Badger is not the mascot at the University of Minnesota. Bucky Badger is the mascot at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. But sometimes Chad GB doesn't correct that assumption. So it doesn't always correct your, your erroneous assumptions. And I did that so that students could, in a pretty low stakes and maybe fun way, learn to use their critical thinking, learn to pick out what aspects of the answer that chat GPT is giving me is correct and what aspect is incorrect. And they know that because they have the common knowledge. Although again, for equity, and because I don't want to assume all University of Wisconsin-Madison students know who Bucky Badger is and what Bucky Badger wears, I actually you know, linked to pictures, I linked to um, videos and the like, because I'm really big on leveling the playing field. Another place where chat GPT has been, and we'll see what happens in future developments, incredibly inaccurate, is that it tends to make up citations. And um, I didn't provide citation checking in the assignment I used this semester, but I will be teaching research methods this summer. And when we get to talking about uh, scholarly articles and citations. That's going to be one of the assignments I'm going to have students do, which is ask Chat GPT to give you 10 scholarly article citations on X topic, and then take each one of those titles and articles, go to Google or Google Scholar or PsycInfo, wherever you want to go, and find that out article. And my prediction, unless Chat GPT really ups its game before this summer, which is very possible, is that about 90% of the article titles and references the entire bibliographic information that ChatGPT provides are to articles that do not exist. And it's ChatGPT is so good that it often 
does not create out of thin air a journal title and sometimes even the page numbers and the volume and the issue numbers are very appropriate. Like, oh, yes, this is 2019. And so it should be volume 486. That's very appropriate. But the title itself and the authors completely fabricate it out of thin air. And I really want students to see that possibility to, again, apply their critical thinking. I, I, I'm critical thinking and access and equity from morning till night, as you probably can sense already. Maybe at some point in the future, journals where actually they'll submit their content to OpenAI in the same way that mm -hmm. we submit to Crossref and um, PsycInfo and all of those other databases so that it'll be sure to have the latest. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just thinking Absolutely. that would be cool. <laughs> well, and, you know, again, when you asked me about, um, you know, what ways would I have used that? Um, you know, I, I love the literature. I often say I spend way too much time reading the literature, although it's probably an appropriate amount of time. And one of my favorite things is something comes up in a conversation and I have some time later in the afternoon or evening is I'll go over to Google Scholar and I'll look at the, you know, top 50 citations for some topic that came up, whatever that might be. And I love doing that. And wouldn't it be helpful if I could instead go to chat GPT or some other app and say, give me the top 20 you know, citations on this particular topic. I'm already kind of getting that from Google Scholar. And of course, I'm old enough to remember that that's also uh, a, a shortcut, one might say, that we didn't have 40 years ago. So 40 years ago, if I was interested in even the most common of topics like language comprehension, what did I do? Well, I had to go to the library and sit in the stacks and pull down these really heavy books and thumb through every single issue and volume of multiple journals. And so moving from there to, for example, database queries to now Google Scholar and to maybe eventually chat GPT providing that information. To me, I see that as all a transition and the field will change along with it. So the third goal is to require students to become familiar with a chat GPT detector, which that that was cool. I had never heard that this even existed. Um, now, does it still function? Because I think it said it was for GPT-2. It, it still works well with, are we on four or five now? Yeah, four, yeah I think some people are already to five. I'm still <laughs> on four. Uh, at least my experience is that the detectors are still working, and there's not just even one. There's multiple ones that are out there. Having said that, what I really want to, my goal in this assignment was, again, leveling the playing field. So some students already know that there are such things as detectors, and other students didn't. I wanted all students to share that knowledge so that it wasn't just the privileged few who knew. And the way that I um, created the assignment, it actually worked pretty well. I asked students to take one of their own assignments. So the text that they had submitted on our learning management system of one of their own assignments. And then I had had ChatGPT create um, to generate an, the, the, the same type text, same prompt, et cetera. And they take each of those two, their own created assignment and ChatGPT created assignment and put them into the detector. And um, it I would say the accuracy was pretty high. It was pretty high in terms of always safely identifying that the student created assignment was student created and safely identifying that the chat GPT created assignment was chat GPT created. Having said that, I do not in any way, shape or form advocate that instructors use the output of detectors to score assignments or even to make assumptions about which assignments were used with a large language learning model like ChatGPT. I do not think we have the level of accuracy that is high enough to use it to make such important decisions about academic integrity. And so I really discourage other instructors from using that as their litmus test for whether a student has used chat GPT or not, because we're just not there. And as we know with other surveillance systems, for example, online test surveillance, that there's a lot of noise in the system. And so in prior to making any assumption that a student is cheating 
or has violated some academic integrity rule, I would be, I think the evidence has to be pretty high. And I do not think that the chat GPT detectors are even close to being that level of accuracy. You would think that eventually you'd be able to put it into chat GPT and say, did you make this? And it would look back and say, yes, I did. <laughs> well, and, and they've also discussed about having some type of the electronic watermark that um, would also be able to be. So everything that is generated, mm -hmm. of course, if that's the case, then just altering the words and, and the like would get you around that. But um, at least at this point, as I said, I don't really want to underscore. I do not think that we should be using detectors to assess whether students have complied with academic integrity requirements. So the fourth goal was to require students to inform you that they use ChatGPT for their coursework. Does a student's use of ChatGPT maybe change the way you grade an assignment? Like, do you have a higher expectation if they're assisted by the software? No, I don't. Um, I mostly wanted students to inform me uh, for my own curiosity. I'm just curious when and how they're using ChatGPT, just as you asked me at the beginning of the podcast, have I used it? And what kinds of things do I use it for? And so some of my requests for them to tell me is through my own curiosity. But another reason is I'm also very um, strong on transparency. And as I've noticed uh, recently, COPE, which is the Committee on Publication Ethics, and the JAMA Network, which publishes the Journal of the American Medical Association, have also come out in selling authors of sc scholarly articles to be published in their, art in their journal that they can use. Uh, large language learning models like chat GPT, but they need to identify that. And, you know, we do that in science and particularly in psychology all the time. We talk about what instruments we've used. Uh, many times if we're doing some complex statistical analysis, we'll talk about what statistical app or software we used. Um, in the old days when we used to do things like with tachistoscopes and memory drums and the like light and things like that, we even talked about what brand of tachistoscope or memory drum we use. So to me, this is all about transparency. It's not saying you're required to always do this on your own, just like back to um, statistics. You no longer have to do factor analyses with paper and pen. Um, you can use apps and software to help you in your research. And I believe that students can use spell check and grammar check and all sorts of apps to help them in their schoolwork, but just be transparent about it. Are there any changes that professors should make um, regarding graded assignments and tests that they send out, um, you know, to ensure that the students have actually learned a subject and not just use chat GBT? Like, should they submit the test to chat GPT and make sure that it can't, I don't know, just answer all the questions perfectly and things like that? Or, Well, I think this is a great time for us as instructors and us as cognitive psychologists who study learning and memory and attention, because it's really challenging us to think about, well, excuse me, what does it mean to learn a subject? What is learning? Is learning being able to just sit down and write your heart out without having access to any other materials? I mean, very few times in my professional life, and I've been in academia now, yeah, 40 years, has anyone ever said, go into this room, you're not going to have access to any of your resources, you're not going to be able to have talked with other colleagues about your ideas, and we want you to do X instead. Now, I think of myself as a reasonably well-learned person, and particularly in my area of expertise, I think I'm, you know, reasonably well-learned. But I don't, I'm not so convinced that demonstrating mastery means that you can't use tools and that you have learned to use. As I gave the example of trying to do a, or in the old days when 
psychology majors had to do factor analyses by hand. And then, of course, there are people who asked psychology majors to do ANOVAs by hand. But these days, most of us turn to R or my basic stats course. I let students use online calculators. And there are plenty of them for everything from even a two by two ANOVA. And so I think it's a great time for us to think about what does it mean to learn something? Um, What does it mean that you have learned something? And how do we demonstrate our mastery of learning? And I think those are questions that have probably challenged us throughout higher education. But this is now, I think, a great time for us to come close to, to, to to close in on that question and and consider how will I assume that someone has learned something. Moreover, now that we're talking about um, AI and other systems like that, are we going to claim that Chat GPT has learned something because it can provide that information? I think this is just a really exciting time. I know everyone's talking about chat GPT, but I wondered, are there other apps or programs or software or whatever that would also be useful in the classroom? It's a great question. As I said, I think that spell check and grammar check, <laughs> even though they were rife with concern and it, it, when they first came out, I, I think that those help students. In my psychological effects of the internet course, I require students to um, download and use for at least one day a Pomodoro timer. So some people might be familiar with these. These are timers that um, allow you to work. You set the amount of time to work constantly, let's say for 15 minutes, and then you might get a five minute break. And the nice thing about having Pomodoro timer on the internet is that you can also tell it and shut everything else down. You know, uh, turn off my email, turn off my browsers, turn off my texting system. I'm going to work solidly for 15 minutes. And I require students just to try those. You might not end up wanting to use them, but just try it and see if you like it. I also require students to download and use an app that does not allow them to text while they're driving. (laughs) And they might not choose to continue to use such an app, but at least I want them to be experienced in that. And I think any apps that can help us with attention, with defeating distraction, with organization and other so-called executive function tasks are really to be cherished at this point. Because I think that learning and being a student in a higher education is hard enough without our requiring students to have to do every one of these things on their own. Perfect. Well, I don't want to run you over time. And honestly, I'm tempted to say we could meet again and we could specifically talk about memory and stuff like that, because I think that that's what these last couple of questions are. Honestly, I think that as an episode in itself would be interesting. I don't know if you're interested in that. Sure. Um, sure. I mean, maybe. it is. It's true. It's what what is learning? What is yeah. memory? Is memory just being able to spit out the answers? You know, I, we, we didn't cover, and that's fine, but we didn't cover about, you know, redesigning your assignments. But in fact, as you probably saw in my 15-minute presentation, I, I had a dig at my own university who makes all of us take this cybersecurity training. And the way that they demonstrate that we have learned cybersecurity, so, you know, we're, we're mm-hmm. safe now, is that we answer these 15 multiple choice questions, which Chad GPT can do like in a heartbeat. And it's like, is that enough? You know, are are you sure as a university, you really want to trust your cybersecurity to, to be, you know, it's, I, I think these are huge questions. I really, really do think it's huge. And what do memory aids help you with? And even, so I won't take any more time because I know my time is about up too, but this was really fun. I would be delighted to okay. work with you again. You've just listened to another episode of Psych Everywhere. If you haven't already subscribed to Psych Everywhere, go ahead and follow us wherever you go for podcasts. Tell a friend or a colleague about the show. Word of mouth is a huge help for podcasts. So share what you learned at the dinner table 
or in your classes. You can also follow us on Twitter at Psychi Podcast and leave a review at Apple Podcast or wherever you go for podcast. You'll absolutely make my day. And more importantly, you'll be helping us to get psych everywhere. Okay, that's all for now. I'll connect with you again soon. Copyright 2023, Psychi, the International Honor Society in Psychology. All rights reserved.